Mr. Speaker. Huh? It gone good. Mr. Speaker, I rise to join my colleagues in support of the 2024-2025 appropriation bill, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, before I continue, Mr. Speaker, after the Prime Minister delivered his speech on Tuesday, I had a little chance to reflect, Mr. Speaker, and I picked up this card of my membership of the Senate Labour Party, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it is for one of those reasons why I'm proud to be a member of the Senate Labour Party and a member of a Senate Labour Party government, fully. Mr. Speaker, it goes on to say the light of the star will illumine this land and a new breed of men will emerge to grapple with the problems of forging a new and just society. Mr. Speaker, our Prime Minister is that man to grapple with the problems to forge a new and just society. There are two types of people in politics, Mr. Speaker. Those who want to do something, sorry, those who want to be something, title and rank, and those who want to do something, Mr. Speaker. We, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, are of the latter. We want to do something. We are proud to be members of the Labour government, and we will continue, Mr. Speaker, to keep our eyes fixed on the prize. It was Oscar Wilde, Mr. Speaker, who, who wrote, those who know the price, there are those who know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. We needed, Mr. Speaker, to design an economy that feels fairer to people. That, Mr. Speaker, is the greatest challenge of our time. This is at the heart of our Prime Minister and this government. The Prime Minister's gift, Mr. Speaker, is that he could be solid in economic theory and a real person at the same time. He takes time, Mr. Speaker, to connect our policies to people. He hears, understands, and gives voice to the concerns and makes provision for the concerns in our discussions in Cabinet. Mr. Speaker, take for example, the livable wage, increase for pensioners, university graduate per household, one laptop per child, maths and English fees, facility fees, and I know, Mr. Speaker, the intention is to include a language and a science subject in the not too distant future. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we are simply trying to close the circle of the redistribution of the economic pie. Our job is to build an economy that is more inclusive, more sustainable, and more just. That is what we have strived to do in, this, in previous budgets. With the 2024-2025 budget, making a deliberate effort, Mr. Speaker, to invest in our hard and soft infrastructure. Inclusive growth, Mr. Speaker, focusing on creating a level playing field. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that the future of the citizens of this country should be determined by the talent and effort and not predestined not predestined by the background. This approach is based on the belief that success is based on merit and ability rather than the circumstances of their birth. What we witnessed from the last administration was nothing short of bad economics on display. Better economics is what we have witnessed over the few budgets, over the few budget stats, with the realization that the approach we inherited was inadequate for the range and magnitude of the challenges we face as a country. These policies, Mr. Speaker, are not only about economic growth, but enhancing the quality of life. Mr. Speaker, together we emerge stronger and better. Last year, Mr. Speaker, we came before this House with a budget of renewed dynamism, hope, and optimism. These results, Mr. Speaker, testify to the efficiency of our strategy. Economic growth, Mr. Speaker, more jobs, higher revenue, higher investment, and higher foreign direct investment. But also, Mr. Speaker, more solidarity, more equity, more equity and progress, higher levels of sustainability, and greater inclusiveness. We rose to the challenge, Mr. Speaker, of building back the economy. Under the leadership of the Prime Minister, the Honourable Member for Castries East, Mr. Speaker, 
we acted boldly by protecting households faced with rising cost of living. We provided increased benefits. We invested in entrepreneurship, promoting sustainable growth that creates jobs for our youth and consolidating the safety net of the most vulnerable. Taken together, Mr. Speaker, these measures represent an investment of millions of dollars in the people of St. Lucia. This economic philosophy is action, this economic philosophy in action is bearing its fruits. Mr. Speaker, the figures speak for themselves. Now is the time to continue building the future we want together. Building with strength, building with empathy, and building with a purpose. Mr. Speaker, we have dared to do what the previous government failed to do. We are giving back to the population what they have given to our country. It is a choice of society. It is our choice to care for the people of this country. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we are strengthening the foundations of our economy, continuing the transformation into a sustainable economy, and focused on building the future we deserve. As a nation, we must, Mr. Speaker, aim towards full employment, ensuring that next to no household is workless, enabling those willing to enter the job market to do so, Mr. Speaker. The ICT BPO sector, for example, Mr. Speaker, has been resilient during the pandemic. It is pivotal to the socioeconomic development and employment creation of this country. Over the years, Mr. Speaker, the sector has grown consistently. To bring the sector to the next level of development, we need to improve the capacity of our workforce. And perhaps, Mr. Speaker, a facility within ancillary canneries, which I hope to hear from the member of Cash South to announce when he stands to speak, would go a long way, Mr. Speaker. Our second strategy is to continue the transformation of St. Lucia into a sustainable economy in terms of energy, water, and the circular economy. We must take steps, Mr. Speaker, to protect our environment and reduce our carbon footprint. We must, Mr. Speaker, give priority to the health and well-being of, well of our children by investing in their education, healthcare, and safety and continue, Mr. Speaker, to strengthen our infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we are facing a critical moment where our actions today will determine our future. We have put in place a bold strategy to reduce our reliance on non-renewable sources of, sources of energy. Our transition towards a more secure, cleaner, greener, homegrown energy supply is well underway, Mr. Speaker, and I imagine the, the senior minister will espouse more on that. Mr. Speaker, the development of our youth is essential to the well-being of our society. Youth and sports are fundamentally linked. Government will continue to invest to support our local athletes, despite the reckless letter penned by the leader of the opposition to an international financial institution. That not being enough, Mr. Speaker, while checking out real estate in Washington, he stopped for a photo opportunity and any chance he got to denigrate this country. Mr. Speaker, he cannot name one officially met in Washington. It's all been smoke and mirrors. He cannot, Mr. Speaker, name one officially met in, the, in Washington. All smoke and mirrors. Mr. Speaker, we are investing in the purchasing power and the welfare of our citizens directly, assisting the most vulnerable of our society and decreasing inequality, making our fiscal regime even fairer and more equal, aiming at the future we all deserve as a nation. For hundreds and thousands of our citizens, Mr. Speaker, for the towns and villages, for the most vulnerable in our society. We have to prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable groups in our community, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to provide them with the continued support. I will continue to support the vulnerable households to purchase wheelchairs, spectacle, hearing aids, and dentures in my constituency, Mr. Speaker. Access to affordable housing, Mr. Speaker, remains a top priority of this government. And as we are aware, Mr. Speaker, there are sites now in Jackmel, in Mondo, in Ancillary, and in Canneries. And I expect the Minister of Housing and the Minister of Investments to continue to work, Mr. Speaker, to deliver the housing revolution for us in Ancillary Canneries. I will thank him in advance, Mr. Speaker, both ministers, Mr. Speaker, in advance. So they can't change their mind now to ensure that we get this housing revolution in our constituency, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the well-being and development of our children are critical to the development of our country. They are our future. 
we must ensure that every child in our country has access to quality education, a safe and nurturing environment, and the opportunity to thrive. We will engage, Mr. Speaker, in a massive school rehabilitation program across the island. Mr. Speaker, the elderly, they are the pride, and they deserve our respect and recognition. Mr. Speaker, this budget, Appropriation Bill 2425, is one in which we dare and we care. We have transformed our economy by making it easier for businesses to invest, hire, and grow. We are building the economic blocks which will drive our growth and resilience, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, there will be no resilience whilst inequality exists. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we have made that a similar, a very important pillar of our transformation, Mr. Speaker. We have made our citizens the very heart of our policies. The government of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, as you know, is considering a range of options to finance environmental and social goals, Mr. Speaker, including the issuance of thematic bonds. Subject to market conditions, the government plans to tap the international financial markets at the appropriate time. St. Lucia is vulnerable to climate change due to three main conditions. One, small geographic area, so disasters take on a countrywide proportion. Two, its location is one of the highest risk areas on the planet, hurricane belt, volcanic and seismic activity, and direct forces of the ocean. And three, dependence on few sources of income, namely tourism and a little bit of agriculture. Mr. Speaker, this country has strong ESG priorities. St. Lucia has prepared and commenced the implementation of its National Adaptation Plan, which includes a set of 271 climate change adaptation initiatives across eight sectors that are aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This government, Mr. Speaker, is prepared and started to implement five sectoral adaptation strategy and action plans for five sectors including water, fisheries, resilient ecosystem, agriculture, and tourism. St. Lucia's oceans, Mr. Speaker, play a critical role in climate mitigation and adaptation. As a country surrounded by water, St. Lucia is planning to build and support its economic recovery and resilience by strengthening the sustainability and competitiveness of the two critical and interconnected sectors, tourism and fisheries, and and expanding its infrastructure for waste water management. Mr. Speaker, we have a real challenge in the Cashews Harbor. That challenge has begun to affect the coral reefs in my constituency, Mr. Speaker, hampering any opportunity that I may have to generate revenue from my coastal waters, Mr. Speaker. A thematic bond issuance, namely a blue bond issuance, Mr. Speaker, provides an ideal platform for St. Lucia to fund these projects and raise awareness of its commitments to protecting its oceans. The bond, Mr. Speaker, will be used to fund two major projects, design and construction of a wastewater treatment facility and the development of sustainable fisheries practices in St. Lucia to scale up the fisheries sector in a sustainable manner. These projects align with Sustainable Development Goal 14, Mr. Speaker, Live Blue Water, and six, Clean Water and Sanitation. Climate change is an immediate and ever-present threat to the lives and livelihood of a large number of people in this country, Mr. Speaker. As a small island developing state, St. Lucia is especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Concurrent with our ambition to prepare St. Lucia and its people for the years ahead, the government recognizes the critical importance of economic diversification and a thriving, sustainable blue economy to its future. For St. Lucia's blue bond framework will enable it to issue blue bonds in the near future to achieve this aim. The government aims to be an exemplar in fiscal management and in, and ex, and in exploring financing mechanisms which will be value accretive to its ambition to be a resilient and sustainable blue economy. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to play our role on the international stage and contribute to the ongoing development of the OECD guidance for development cooperation for a sustainable economy and the ocean investment protocol. 
If the oceans were considered a country, Mr. Speaker, they would be ranked among, amongst the world's top economies. This is because the economic value of the ocean economy, described as gross marine product, is estimated at approximately USD $2.5 trillion per year, Mr. Speaker, or about 3% of global GDP. Those figures al alone, Mr. Speaker, will make the oceans the world's seventh largest economy. More than 3 billion people, Mr. Speaker, globally, depend on coastal and marine ecosystems daily for their livelihoods. It is estimated that more than 350 million jobs are linked to the oceans worldwide, and that the value of the key ocean assets is at least, Mr. Speaker, 24 trillion US dollars. The oceans are key to addressing many of the interconnected challenges facing our world today. Oceans, Mr. Speaker, absorb 30% of global carbon dioxide emissions and acts as an enormous heat sink for the planet, storing nearly 93% of all excess heat, all excess heat energy generated. The ocean is the world's largest ecosystem, covering 70% of the Earth's surface and home to an estimated 80% of the planet's diversity. The oceans are, however, facing a multitude of challenges. We are now seeing detrimental effects of climate change, biodiversity loss, overexploitation, and the pollution of the oceans. Climate change is an immediate and ever-present threat to the lives and livelihood of large numbers of people around the world. Many small island developing states are facing existential issues with the risk posed by increasing sea level rises, loss of incomes, and livelihood due to ocean pollution, coastal erosion, and adverse weather patterns, Mr. Speaker. And this is very important to me, Mr. Speaker. As you know, I am representing a coastal community, and we rely heavily on the fishing community, Mr. Speaker. It is therefore important that protecting the oceans benefit from the same level of urgency and priority as we have for protecting the terrestrial parts of the planet. It is also important, Mr. Speaker, to recognize that the abundant opportunities which the oceans provide by way of solutions to the pressing issues of global hunger, productive employment, nature loss, climate change, and energy security. As a small island developing state, 238 square miles, Mr. Speaker, our natural disasters take on a countrywide proportion. We are located, Mr. Speaker, as I've said before, in one of the highest risk areas of the planet. This risk, Mr. Speaker, high volcanic and seismic activity, being situated in a hurricane belt and direct exposure to the forces of our oceans. Mr. Speaker, all presenting a challenge for us insofar as being in an insurable region, Mr. Speaker. A very difficult challenge we will have to confront in the not too distant future. And most importantly, we rely on a few sources of income for a substantial part of our GDP, namely tourism and agriculture. St. Lucia is especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Therefore, the government of St. Lucia is committed to building resilience and implementing adaptation actions to counter our vulnerability to climate change. St. Lucia's natural, nationally determined contribution highlights the importance of the health co-benefits of climate mitigation and identifies human health as a key priority for adaptation implementation. The sustainable blue economy, Mr. Speaker, is an economy based on a Circularity, circularity, collaboration, resilience, opportunity, and interdependence. Its growth, Mr. Speaker, is driven by investments that reduce carbon emissions and pollutions, enhance energy efficiency, enhance the power of natural capital, and the benefits that these ecosystems provide and halt the loss of biodiversity. The government of St. Lucia intends to operationalize its blue economy ambitions and sustainably leverage its ocean-based resources to support its economic diversification in accordance with its national oceans policy and in line with Sustainable Development Goal 6, Clean Water and Sanitation, and Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water. It is hoped, Mr. Speaker, with targeted blue investment that St. Lucia will be able to realize our vision of ensuring that our marine resources and natural heritage are sustainably managed, nurtured, and protected for the benefit of current and future generations. To this end, Mr. Speaker, in December 2023, around COP28, we launched our Blue Bond Framework. We were pleased to announce that our Blue Bond Framework, Mr. Speaker, is the first framework 
a link to the Global Practitioner's Guide for Bonds to Finance the Sustainable Blue Economy. And that framework, Mr. Speaker, was launched in Dubai by our Minister of Sustainable Development, the member for Denry, Denry Nuff. Whilst the more mainstream ocean sectors are able to access finance commercially, it is estimated that USD 1 trillion of additional finance is required by 2030, and USD 2 trillion of finance is required between 2030 and 2050 to deliver ocean climate mitigation measures. Mr. Speaker, the adaptation bill in St. Lucia is almost $400, $400 million, Mr. Speaker. Ocean-based solutions also need to be supported with finance at scale, including to bring about a transformational change to the approach towards management of the oceans and to encourage the growth of a sustainable blue economy. According to the International Financial Corporation, Mr. Speaker, a member of the World Bank Group, protecting the oceans and preserving clean water resources is more than just a moral imperative. It is also a growing financial opportunity. Although sustainability as a theme has evolved over the past decades, there is less awareness of the strategic importance of all the full potential of the blue economy sectors, such as resilient ports, shipping, green ports, sustainable tourism, and marine offshore wind renewable energy, amongst others, could be realized if finance flows are unlocked. According to the high-level panel, Mr. Speaker, of Sustainable Ocean Economy, Investing in social economy, in, in sustainable ocean economy, could bring net positive returns. Investing Euros 2.54 trillion in 2020 in just four ocean-based solutions, Mr. Speaker, was able to transform that benefit into 14.11 trillion by 2050, Euros by 2050. Private sector investors, Mr. Speaker, are critical to filling the funding gap which exists in the blue economy. Investors in the blue economy have varied investment outcome expectations. Investment, investors' decisions to invest in the blue economy would also be informed by their risk appetite, the anticipated risk adjusted returns, and their investments, whether it's liquid or otherwise. Given the variability, Mr. Speaker, in those factors, and the importance of private sector investors, it is essential to promote the availability of information, awareness of the different types of blue economy investment opportunities, and the recognition of the industries and states in which those opportunities lie, Mr. Speaker. At COP28 meetings in Dubai, one of the key themes for climate finance, Mr. Speaker, and one of the outcomes for those meetings, widely referred to as the UAE consensus, was the objective of making climate finance available, accessible, and affordable. Support for a sustainable blue economy is therefore a critical need, and one which deserves the immediate attention of governments, policymakers, private sector institutions, and other non-state actors. The 2023 G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration, Mr. Speaker, included a commitment to pursuing reforms for more effective multilateral development banks. MDBs, Mr. Speaker, have a critical role in enhancing, expanding, and diversifying risk transfer mechanisms in order that the private finance can be mobilized at pace and at scale for projects, including the relation to the blue economy. MDBs could play a key role, Mr. Speaker, in facilitating the wider adoption of blue finance within the investor community, helping to de-risk, Mr. Speaker, economic exposures and provide credit enhancements to other forms of blended finance. Lowering the cost of capital through de-risking, Mr. Speaker, or through these financing mechanisms is critical to, ensure, to ensuring that the debt availed is sustainable and there is enough fiscal space with our national budgets to undertake meaningful nature positive and climate resilient action. The Joint Declaration and Task Force on Credit Enhancement of Sustainability Link Sovereign Financing for Nature and Climate, launched also at COP28, is a crucial step in responding to the needs of the Global South countries by providing long-term fiscal solutions, avoiding short-term debt relief that relies solely on international development assistance. Mr. Speaker, the One Planet Solving Wealth Funds Initiative was launched also in December, Mr. Speaker, in Paris to accelerate the integration of climate change analysis into the management of large, long-term, and diversified asset pools. One of the objectives, Mr. Speaker, of the One Planet Solving Wealth Fund Initiative is to help mobilize the capital of solving wealth funds towards the implementation of the Paris Agreement, 
including by working to rapidly grow the investable market for climate solutions. And Mr. Speaker, as you know, we will be very shortly be bringing our sovereign wealth fund legislation to Parliament for endorsement, Mr. Speaker. The sovereign wealth funds and state-owned institutions can also help channel more investment into the sustainable blue economy and make instruments such as blue bonds more widely adopted, which in turn will enable a deeper and more liquid blue bond market as issuance volumes grow. The first green bond, Mr. Speaker, was issued by the European Investment Bank in 2007. Since then, the global green bond market has grown exponentially to approximately the USD 2.334 trillion of issuances. With clear sustainability taxonomies and with the adoption of frameworks such as the Blue Bond Guidance, by more issuers, there is a possibility of blue bonds replicating the success of green bonds and having a pronounced impact on finance flows towards sustainable development 14 and ocean conservation solutions. Mr. Speaker, sustainable development 14 and 6 are the least funded of all these sustainable development goals. It will be important for the financial sector and other stakeholders in the blue economy to recognize the utility of aligning the capital raising strategy with blue finance and thereby creating blue asset classes for investors. A number of ocean-based industries, Mr. Speaker, such as shipping, ports, seafood, and fisheries could benefit from having their capital raising labeled as blue. And this could encourage more investors to engage with these industries and more issuers to align their business practices with ocean conservation, as well as to promote ancillary capital flows to these sectors. We need both the public and private sector, Mr. Speaker, to keep the finance discussion alive. Mr. Speaker, I am a proud product of the constituency of Ansari Canaries, Mr. Speaker. The dignity, Mr. Speaker, of my constituency matters to me, and I know it matters not to others, Mr. Speaker. Look how they find joy, Mr. Speaker, in reminding us of our challenges, whether it is on Facebook, in the local media, when they're having their fireside chats in the north, but answer your canaries, Mr. Speaker, in or in Trinidad, Mr. Speaker. But answer your canaries, Mr. Speaker, seems to be the go-to constituency whenever people are suffering misery in their own personal lives, Mr. Speaker. I say to the constituent of answer your canaries, Mr. Speaker, search your hearts, search your mind. You are better off today with a Sanusha Labour Party government. We have the gifts, Mr. the talents, Mr. Speaker. We have the skills, and we are not of a lesser God. One second. This, Mr. Speaker, is our guiding principle. This is the vision of our Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your resilience. Today, we are in a much better shape. I do what I do for the constituency of Ansari Canaries out of the love and gratitude for the constituency that raised me and fortified me. It gives me great joy, Mr. Speaker, to put in the long hours to make a difference in their lives. This government, Mr. Speaker, led by the Honorable Prime Minister, Member of Parliament for Cashless East, is committed to making a difference in their lives and every one of you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, before I, I, I wrap this, I wanted to have a discussion about the issue of, which was raised recently about taxes, Mr. Speaker. The opposition, Mr. Speaker, is intent on suggesting to the Tanusha population that we are overtaxing them, Mr. Speaker. But well, Mr. Speaker, I did a little bit of, of, of research and I realized that the, the tax to GDP ratio, sorry, the tax to GDP ratio, Mr. Speaker, for St. Lucia, for the LSE, and for the OECD, Mr. Speaker. Would you be surprised, Mr. Speaker, that the tax to GDP ratio as of 2023 for St. Lucia is 21.8%, Mr. Speaker. 
For the OECD, Mr. Speaker, 44.1 percent, Mr. Speaker. For Barbados, Mr. Speaker, 31.9 percent, Mr. Speaker. For Jamaica, Mr. Speaker, 27.9 percent. All in all, Mr. Speaker, the highest tax to GDP ratio ever recorded in St. Lucia was under the reign of the United Workers Party. And the lowest, Mr. Speaker, was under the reign of a St. Lucia Labour Party. Oh, Mr. Speaker, this came from the OECD IDB documentation, Mr. Speaker, which, if the Prime Minister so approves, we could make a document of the House because it's publicly held information, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there was also the conversation about wastage. And I wanted, Mr. Speaker, to just draw a little reference to what took place in the South, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would you be aware, would you know that, Mr. Speaker, that initially at the Euronero International Airport, the foundation package, Mr. Speaker, was meant to cost $1.8 million, Mr. Speaker. Of late, Mr. Speaker, before we got into office, when we got into office, Mr. Speaker, that cost had spiraled to $19 million, Mr. Speaker. Nineteen one nine million, Mr. Speaker. The shell package, Mr. Speaker, was eighty-three point eight million. It then ballooned to one hundred and eight million dollars, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when they want to speak about wastage and that we are not taking the people's money seriously, Mr. Speaker, I wonder what you call those estimates, Mr. Speaker, because there's a report from the OECC, Mr. Speaker, which make clear, clear, unequivocal points, Mr. Speaker in terms of the inconsistency and the frequent revisions of design details resulting from 261, Mr. Speaker, requests for revisions, Mr. Speaker. 266, sorry, Mr. Speaker, revisions. Which begs the question, Mr. Speaker, when they commenced the project, Mr. Speaker, were they not aware of what it is that they were trying to build? 266, Mr. Speaker. It's a significant sum, Mr. Speaker. Were they not aware of what they were trying to build? Mr. Speaker, in the hidden letter, it also went on to suggest, Mr. Speaker, to reduce the project costs. It was suggested not to consider the elevated drive at this stage, to reduce the building floor area, and, to re and the reduction of one jet bridge, Mr. Speaker. None of that, Mr. Speaker, was adhered to. But today, Mr. Speaker, they want to come and question the capability of our current Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, without getting my colleagues a bit worried, Mr. Speaker, I took time, Mr. Speaker, to just jot down the projects that have been unveiled or already done or in the process of being done in the constituency of answer recanaries, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you can hear them making murmurs, Mr. Speaker. I will only give you some, Mr. Speaker, because I still want them, I still want them to be friends of mine afterwards, Mr. Speaker. But we do, Mr. Speaker, welcome the diamond steel pan, Mr. Speaker. Can Beats, Mr. Speaker, is waiting very patiently to compete with the diamond steel orchestra, Mr. Speaker. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister for Investment will also see fit, Mr. Speaker, to continue or to build, Mr. Speaker, a steel pan shed for us in canneries, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, oh, Babona has one, but I want, I want the more than one that the Prime Minister is about to get. A wellness center, Mr. Speaker, was opened in answer, Mr. Speaker. The jetty in answer, Mr. Speaker, was repaired. The mangrove project, Mr. Speaker, is about to commence. We have rehabilitated the Otawa Court, Mr. Speaker, but we have some issue with some derelict vehicle, Mr. Speaker, that sustainable waste has given me the, the assurance that that vehicle will be removed, Mr. Speaker, so we could tidy up the area for a safe space for the young people of Otabo, Mr. Speaker. The bridge in Ansari, Mr. Speaker, is also underway, Mr. Speaker. The mini theater, Mr. Speaker, repairs to the NSDC building, Mr. Speaker, is currently underway. The Van Avenues Road Bypass Road, Mr. Speaker, which the member for Denry North always makes mention as to the, the most... The, the most <laughs> The most talked about Barber Green in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. All the bus shelters, Mr. Speaker, along that road, Mr. Speaker, has been rehabilitated, Mr. Speaker. The Jonas Road, Mr. Speaker. The Jonas Road, Mr. Speaker, has received some treatment, Mr. Speaker. The Montezo Bridge, Mr. Speaker, which just said would never happen, Mr. Speaker, is almost complete, Mr. Speaker. The retaining wall at the Jackwell Community Center, Mr. Speaker, a contract has been awarded and work is about to commence, Mr. Speaker. The canneries market, Mr. Speaker, is completed and we are waiting 
some final details, Mr. Speaker, to move into that, Mr. Speaker. And very importantly, Mr. Speaker, the West Coast Subfire Station, Mr. Speaker, full with equipment, Mr. Speaker, including a fire ambulance, including an ambulance, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, monies were raised for an ambulance before, but we've never seen any of it, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, the member for Sojal was so impressed that the Prime Minister decided to do a West Coast Subfire Station in. In, in the constituency of Ansari Canaries that he said to me that is a feather in my cap. And I thank him for being honest with that comment. The member for soldiers said that. He was very honest. No, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> a sewer treatment plant, Mr. Speaker, for Ansari, Mr. Speaker, because there was this suggestion that the bed and breakfast would be built, Mr. Speaker, and no appropriate arrangements was made for the discharge of the sewer, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, have made just over a million dollars, Mr. Speaker, to be able to facilitate that, Mr. Speaker. The people of Antillary Canaries, everything that the Prime Minister and your Member of Parliament would have said during the election campaign is coming to fruition, Mr. Speaker. We have no time to play games, Mr. Speaker. This is serious business, Mr. Speaker. We take our job very seriously, Mr. Speaker. And I know, Mr. Speaker, I am unable to attend every funeral, but what I do if what I am able to do, Mr. Speaker, is to contribute to the burial of every funeral, Mr. Speaker. Yes, 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 Mr. Speaker. I may not, Mr. Speaker, be at every funeral, Mr. Speaker, but we do contribute to the burial assistance of everyone, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know they would like to see more of me, Mr. Speaker, and I am not making any, any excuses for it, Mr. Speaker, and I endeavor to, do, to get better at that, Mr. Speaker. I endeavor to get better at that, Mr. Speaker. I ask them, Mr. Speaker, to continue to give me that support and encouragement, Mr. Speaker. Continue to support and, and support the government, Mr. Speaker. Support the member of parliament, Mr. Speaker. And ensure we keep our eye on the prize. A transformative anti-area canneries, a better anti-area canneries, a fairer anti-area canneries, and a better country for all, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.